All right, welcome to AP Video 10.8. Here we're looking at the properties, structure, and types of solids. The main objectives here are, are to be able to contrast the different types of solids, crystalline and amorphous solids, and then to look more closely at crystalline solids and be able to classify them as ionic, covalent, or molecular, covalent network, metallic, or atomic. All right, let's get going. All right, so backing it up, uh, the, the, the major classifications of solids um, are the amorphous solid, and uh, the crystalline solid. And the amorphous solid is basically a um, highly disordered arrangement of solid particles. Um, so some really good examples of amorphous solids are like glass and ceramics. Um, here's what amorphous glass looks like at the molecular level. It's highly irregular. There is no regular p repeating pattern to this, which is why one of the reasons when you you know, break a window, it fractures in an unpredictable pattern because at the molecular level, there is no pattern to how the structure is made. Okay, the other classification that's basically the opposite of amorphous. You know, amorphous basically means without shape. Uh, crystalline solids, the other ones, and they're highly ordered arrangements of solid particles. So if you think well, like quartz, quartz has this nice regular repeating pattern of SiO2. So SiO2 makes up both glass and uh, quartz but it's highly arranged in the quartz where glass is not. Um, and take a look, here's, some, here's a picture of quartz here. You can definitely see the highly order to this. It's got some nice shapes, so those gems are being formed there. All right, so kind of describing crystalline solids a little more in detail. So crystalline solids always have what we call a lattice, or a crystal lattice, which is essentially is a three-dimensional system of points that designate the position of the particles. So here's some different ways we can organize them. And the particles that occupy those points, that's kind of a big idea, because they could be atoms, they could be ions, or they could be molecules. And depending on what you have there, atoms, ions, or molecules, it determines which type of solid you have, as you'll see on the next page. Um, when it comes down to a crystal, the smallest repeating unit of the whole lattice that basically represents the whole thing is called the unit cell. So once you identify what the unit cell is, that basically repeats itself over and over and over again and makes up the uh, huge crystal lattice. So like here's the la some different lattices you can see here, and we'll just kind of stick with a simple one here. Um, there's kind of this regular repeating shape right here, just a simple cube. Okay, And so here would be the, the simplest shape, that would be the unit cell of this particular lattice. Okay, And basically, on all four points there, the simplest repeating pattern is what we call the 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 simple cubic. Okay, it's obviously just a simple cube there. And if we talk about like the space filling way, um, on each of those points there, essentially there's an eighth of an atom here and it occupies each of those four points there. Um, the next one over has a body center, which basically means there's an atom in the center of this one. As you can see, there it is, kind of sticking in there. Body centered. That's how this one's centered. The next one is called face centered because on the the face of all parts of the the cube here. There's actually uh, um, a face of a, a full face of an atom right there. So these are some of the different types here. Uh, to be honest, I'm not going to test you on these. I, I wouldn't. I'd be very surprised if they're on the AP exam. It's not the main focus here. Um, but th the big idea here is that a crystal lattice is a three di three dimensional regular arrangement of the, the particles in there. And the simplest repeating is called the unit cell. So now we're going to get into some of the different types of crystalline solids. Okay. And there's five major types, three of which actually belong under the atom category. So we're going to look at um, which type of particle is at each of these points. So if these points here are an atom, we call them atomic solids. If the points of the crystal lattice are made up of ions, or if they're made up of molecules, they're considered ionic, comp ionic solids or molecular solids, respectively. So what happens to be at the points is the type of solid you're going to have. And then what holds those things together could be a couple different things. It could be bonds, or it could be IMFs that actually hold some of these things together. So let's take a look. The first type we'll start with is the ions. If ions are at the points of the crystal lattice, we call it an ionic solid. So here's a particular crystal lattice, and you have ions at every one of the points. So this is what we call um, an ionic solid. All the ions are held together by ionic bonds. That's what holds ions to ions. And some examples are just sodium chloride, metal and nonmetal, iron three oxide, metal and nonmetal. Then here's that weird ammonium, which is that polyatomic ion, and hydroxide put together. So 
cation and an anion. So anytime ions make up the points, they're called ionic compounds. We will discuss some of the properties in detail in class. The next type is molecular solids. When molecules make up every one of those points in the lattice, we call it a molecular solid. And molecular solids, so have the, have the molecules the points, and what holds the molecules together, shouldn't be a surprise here, is intramolecular force. So here's kind of an example of glucose. Each of the, the points on the hexagon here, besides the oxygen there, that represents a carbon atom. And here's kind of what looks like in the space filling model. And then right here, we're showing a crystal lattice, and every one of the points here is a molecule of glucose, and they're held together by intermolecular forces. So when molecules are the points, molecular solid, and some examples are like a glucose molecule, or in ice you have water molecules, or in iodine, uh, which is, here's elemental iodine in crystalline form, um, I2 molecules would be the points of the lattice. Okay, atomic solids is not one of the major fives because this one actually breaks down into the next three right here. But if atoms are the points of the lattice, they're collectively called the atomic solids. Now it comes down to, is it metal? Is it non-metal? Or is it special ones where it's just the group 18 elements, the noble gases? Okay, so we'll go into these in a little more detail. Uh, the type of bonding that, you, that we're going to see here varies with the three different types of atomic solids. So let's start off with the metallic solids. So no surprise here, metal atoms are what occupy the points of lattice. And so here's kind of a very simplified version here. We have metal, what we call the cations now. They're held in position, and their valence electrons basically are this fuzzy area outside here, and they're shared amongst all of the, the atoms here, or amongst all the, the cations. Those electrons are what we call to be delocalized, which means they're mobile, they can move. So let me kind of break this down a little bit further. I, I, I picked a very simple metal here to make it easy on us. So sodium's electron configuration is neon 3s1. What happens is the valence electrons are this like pink region out here. So as soon as sodium loses the valence electrons, so they can be part of the electron C, which is the pink fuzzy region, what's left behind then is just the sodium cation. It's without one electron. So each of these blue spheres here represents a cation that's left over, and the electron that used to be part of sodium occupies this valence electron cloud out here, the, the electron C, where the electrons are free to move about. So we believe that this is the way that metals fit together. And we'll talk more about what this uh, means in terms of uh, the properties of metals, like being conductive and malleable and so forth. Uh, pure metals could be a part of this, like if you had pure polonium, iron, gold, uranium. Alloys also fit into uh, metallic solids, whether it's a, a mixture of different metals or whatever, whatever, um, they also participate in the same type of bonding like this. Um, I do want to break down the, the alloys a little bit. An alloy is essentially um, a mixture of mostly element, uh, metals, which have metallic properties then, of course. Um, let me cross this off. So alloys are mixtures of elements with m metallic properties. It's mostly made of metals. And there's two basic types. So an when you mix two metals together, one way they can mix together is called substitutional. So the host atom would be like the white atoms here, that's kind of the base. And when you want to substitute it or replace the host metal with another metal that has to be of similar size, if they're not similar size, they don't pack together nicely. But if you basically substitute out some white elements with some of the black ones I have here, that's called a substitutional alloy because you're substituting the host metal for something different. Interstitial is when there's holes. It's like there's, I'm going to go back to the, the top one here. There's actually a hole right here, and there's a hole right here. If there's an atom with a small enough size, they can actually pack into those tiny holes there, and smaller atoms can fit inside there. This is an example of an interstitial alloy, whereas the previous examples would call it a sup, uh, s uh, <laughs> substitutional because we substitute in for it. All right. Uh, the next type of solid we have that fits in the atomic category, this is still part of the atomic category now, is the covalent network. This is a very unique type here. Uh, typically we have carbon and silicon, those are the two big bad boys that participate in this type here. All nonmetals are held together by covalent bonds. So every single atom is joined by a covalent bond in this structure here. And basically you create one giant molecule. So if you think about diamond, a diamond is actually one giant molecule where everything is bound together with covalent bonds. 
Uh, both of these are examples of, of carbon, so diamond's an example right here, and graphite's another example. Graphite kind of has like chicken wire, hexagon, carbons that are all covalently bonded together in a flat plane. And then what happens is another plane right below it can stack, another plane can stack there, so these like chicken wires stacked on top of each other, and weak IMFs hold each of these um, layers together. And when you push your pencil down, basically your pencil the pressure is enough to break these and this part gets left behind and it makes pencil marks on your on your paper and as you keep dragging your pencil that direction this next layer gets left right here and the next layer gets left right here and essentially graphite is uh, it's very flat and it's held together with IMFs as you go up and down the structure like that um, another element that does a lot of covalent network bonding where it makes giant molecules is the silicates where it's SI some amount O2 some amount there. Um, quartz, mica, and felspar, they're really good examples of this. Uh, in this huge crystal lattice, essentially, you have silica and oxygen atoms, and they're all covalently bonded together to make gi one giant molecule. So this is the covalent network of uh, solids. And then lastly, we have the group 18 solids, sometimes called 8A via the old system. Basically, these are the noble gases. They're the only elements that belong to this unique group here. Noble gases only become solids at really ridiculously low temperatures. And the only force that can hold noble gases, which are nonpolar, is the LDFs, because LDFs are how nonpolar things stick together. So examples would be if you have like solid neon, argon, or xenon at very low temperatures, you can actually solidify these things. They're highly rare. We never do them in practice. This is probably the least common type of the solids. All right. And in class tomorrow, we'll basically just kind of review what I just talked about in the video. But we'll take it a step further and look at some of the properties that also correspond to these different types of solids. Your big ones, again, are ionic solids, the molecular solids, metallic solids, covalent network, and the group 18. All right. Come ready tomorrow, and we'll talk a little more about these.